thank God that we're going to give God what we have. John chapter 5, verse 1 through 9. And when you have it, would you say amen? amen. Here's what the Bible says. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool, and then and troubled the water. Whosoever then, after the first troubling of the water, stepped in and was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. That's a long time. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another step is down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. Uh, this morning, for the next few moments, we're going to tag this text, Contactless deliverance contactless deliverance somebody ought to put that on the screen to help me preach this morning contactless deliverance over the last few months through this COVID-19 pandemic we have had seared and etched into our psyche the idea of washing our hands not going into any public place without a face covering, and at all times maintaining our social distance. It has become such a normality that even my daughter Mackenzie routinely asks me, Daddy, have you washed your hands? And where is your mask? Make you wonder who the parent is sometimes. Many of the local food establishments have followed suit and have made it easier for us to maintain our social distance. This came to light to me in another way just the other day because I decided that I was going to order some pizza. And when I went online to place the order, I got to the end of it and I had three options. Pick up, delivery, or contactless delivery. Y'all well, stay with me. We're going to live together. And since I didn't know what contactless delivery was, I clicked on the link because I had to know what was the difference between delivery and contactless delivery. And so when I looked at the description of contactless delivery, y'all, I almost dropped my computer and went into a praise right there. Because unlike regular delivery, I hope y'all hear what I'm saying in the Holy Ghost. Contactless delivery means that you can get what you ordered without coming face to face with the delivery person. And can I tell y'all something? I don't already preach everything I can't tell you. Can I tell y'all something? I'm just the delivery man. But what the Lord told me to tell you yes, is that everything that he promised you, he said, I'm going to deliver it right to your door without you having to come face to face with the delivery man. Because all I'm here to do is to deliver what thus said the Lord. But he said, if I said I'm going to deliver you, if I'm going to give you healing, if I'm going to give you your money, whatever it is, he said, I'm going to bring it right to your door and you don't have to come face to face with the delivery man. Tell your neighbor, contactless. Delivery. I want you to know and understand that you ain't in the sanctuary, but the same God who can drop it off at the church can drop it off at your house. And if you believe in Him and what He has spoken unto you, just wait for your doorbell to ring. Because heaven already has you on their 
schedule to bring everything to pass in your life in the midst of a pandemic. He's going to do just what he said he's going to do. Contactless delivery. I hope y'all hear what I'm saying. I'm almost there. I done already told you what I come to tell you. I done already told you what I come to tell you. Even if you can't get to the delivery man, you ain't got to see me face to face. But as long as you can, oh Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, just answer the door. Just answer the door. He's knocking at the door. Just answer the door. Delivery is already outside. What you're waiting on is already there. But in the text that we've read until you hear it, we see Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. And we know that Jerusalem is surrounded by a wall. And so, therefore, the only way to get into the city is you have to come in through one of the gates. The text tells us that Jesus comes into the city through the sheep gate. It's called the sheep gate simply because that's how they led the sheep into the city. Look at the humility of our Christ. That he's going to enter into the city not so that he can get fame or so people can look at him. He says, but I'm going to come in through the same door that the sheep are coming into. Comes in through the sheep gate and when he comes in, he gets on the other side of the gate and there he sees a pool called the pool of Bethesda and it's surrounded by five porches. But here's the scene that when he looks at this pool, around this pool are hundreds of sick and impotent folks. There are blind people there. There are lame people there. There are people who are deaf and dumb. There are people there who have all kinds of maladies around this pool. But the text says in verse number four, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water Whosoever then, first after the troubling of the water stepped in, was made whole of what, whatsoever disease he had. The text says in verse 5 that there was a certain man who was there, and he had an infirmity, y'all, for 38 years. Now here's the thing that comes to mind immediately. How can you go to a place designed to make you well? I hope y'all for 38 years and still have the same stuff wrong with you 38 years later. I hope y'all hear what I'm saying because y'all think I'm talking about John, but I'm talking about Main Tree Church of God in Christ. How is it that 38 years come to the same place where help and hope is and have the same malady that you had for 38 years makes you wonder what's really going on. If God has never lost his power, if the word and the blood still works, then how can you come to this place? Uh, we, we'll talk about that later. I ain't going to keep pushing you. I ain't going to, yeah. I ain't going to kill it, but don't push it. Yes, oh, have mercy. I just want to leave that right there for you. Let's take that with you. So I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Uh, he comes and he looks at this pool, but I want y'all to know this, that the pool literally looked like an ancient day emergency room. I want you to picture this in your mind. It looks like an ancient day emergency room. And I need you to know that an emergency room is a place, y'all, that makes temporary accommodations for emergency situations. That's all the emergency room is. They make temporary accommodations. You don't go to the emergency room and they got dens and couches and all that stuff in the room because you're not meant to stay there. It's temporary accommodations. Uh-huh, for emergency situations. Yes. But here is a man, y'all, who's been in the emergency room for 38 years. Oh. Now, immediately, that, that makes you just look at that and say, something wrong with that because since you are well in your thinking, you can automatically see that it has to be something wrong with somebody who goes and stays in the emergency room for 38 years. But here's what I want you to see. To this man, it made perfect sense. Sometimes we look at people, I don't know why they would do that. That's just crazy. That doesn't make sense. Well, then it makes perfect sense. Because when you're not well in your mind, your will, and your emotions, sometimes you just do crazy stuff. I'm talking to some people who know that you have made some mistakes in life. That now you look back over your life and say, what in the world was I thinking? That's why I'm so glad that the Lord and the nine men won't give you everything you ask for. Because he can look past where you are to where you will be. And he knows that some of the stuff that you wanted, if I would have given it to you, it would have destroyed you. Can I tell y'all, I am so glad that who I could have married. Come on here, somebody. I did marry. 
Because the Lord already knew before the foundation of the entire world how some stuff was going to turn out and he saved me from myself. The Lord told me to tell you that because some of y'all are mad at God right now because of some stuff he didn't release to you. But God said in 20 years you're going to thank me. Right now you're angry but you're going to thank me later. I just want you to look across the sanctuary and say, he, you're going to thank God for that later. You're you going to thank him for it later. Because he sees what you cannot see. And he's opening doors, not based on where you are or where you've been, but he's opening doors based on where he's taking you. He says, yeah, I got it. I'm making sure. He said, yeah, that car that you want to get with that 19% interest? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. You're going to find out one day. Yeah, that, that, ain't what, that ain't what it is. We've been talking about hearing the voice of the Lord. And I had a friend when I was with this with the railroad, just while I was with the railroad, and he was in a position where he was making a lot of money, y'all. And uh, he decided, and all this time he made real good decisions with his money. And they were living in a house that he probably could afford four times the house than what they were living in. And so he decided, I'm gonna go get a brand new house. And he told his wife, go pick out everything you want, all the furniture and all the drapes and all the stuff you want. And they went down there to get the house. She picked the one, had everything ready. They get to the signing table. And when he gets ready to sign the paper, he said, I don't have peace. Now, I'm, I'm trying to, I hope y'all been watching Bible study because you know what I'm talking about. He said, I don't have peace. He said, I just, I just don't have a release in my spirit to sign the paper. So the man looked at him and said, what, what, what do you mean you don't have a release in your spirit? What does that mean? Because some folks don't understand when they're not spiritual. They don't understand that when you don't have a release in your spirit, that something in your shoulder yeah. is telling you that this ain't it, that ain't the one, this ain't the way to go, that there's something wrong with this. Yeah. That's what the Holy Ghost will do. He'll do more than make you speak in tongues. He'll do more than make you shout. He'll make you make better decisions in your life if you listen. Yeah. And so then, he sat at the table and the man said, what do you mean? He said, do you know it's going to cost you $1,500 to, to not sign this paper right now out of all the work we've done. His wife looking at him, tears welling up in her eyes. She said, what are you doing? This is what we've been talking about. This is what we've been dreaming about. He said, I'm sorry, man. I don't have peace. He says, I'd rather pay that $1,500 now than have to pay for it in stress later. Did not sign the paper. Went back to the house they were in and three months later, the Lord told him step down out of that position. Took a significant pay cut. He said, no, this can't be the Lord. This can't be the Lord because he was working in ministry. And so now he was getting to the point where he couldn't do what he needed to do in ministry. And the Lord said, step down. Step down out of the position, y'all. And three months after stepping down from the position, the position he was in got downsized. Which means that if he had a waited, yes, his seniority would have run out from the time that he, didn't, that he missed and he would have been totally out, but now here he is with a huge house and way less money. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. That the Lord can see what you can't see. Yeah. And sometimes your feelings and emotions will get you into some stuff that your Holy Ghost sometimes can't get you out of. Uh -huh. The Lord said, if you do something that's not in my will, that's going to be your will. You can call the Lord all day long, get a sackcloth and ashes. Put oil all over you and put a whole Bible on yourself. But if the Lord done spoke and you didn't heed the voice, he said, that's all on you. I ain't going to let it destroy you. I ain't going to let it take you out of here, but you're going to pray for every bit of what you picked. Amen, somebody. So here's a man who's been in the emergency room literally for 38 years. So literally, he's turned temporary accommodation into a long-term situation. I want, you, I want you to see this. How many people in your life, it's this time for self-assessment, have come to you in an emergency? You made temporary accommodations and they turn it into a long-term situation. Let me say it for you because you they may be in here by you. You may be sitting by me at home, so I want you to have, let me say it so that way it's all my fault. They lost a the job. And they said, I just need a place to crash for a few days. Come on, somebody. But now a couple of weeks are turning to six months. And every time you leave, they at the house. And whenever you come back, they still at the house with the same thing. Oh, when you left the house, the computer ain't warm enough and you ain't look for not what now job. I just might well say now. How many of y'all can look for today now? That, that, that means you ain't did nothing 
For those of y'all who are watching outside the state of Arkansas now, that means nothing. Nothing at all. All right? Uh-huh. You ain't done nothing. Uh-huh. They got a little low on cash, and they say, I need a little help. And you came through for them. And you came through for them that one time. And now every week, your cash app is on fire with requests and text messages. Just let me hold a little something. Turn a temporary accommodation in a long-term situation. You took time out to help them through a difficult season in their lives. But now, every month, they come coming to you with a brand new created crisis. Come on, somebody. And they want to put a demand on your time every time they turn temporary accommodation to a long-term situation. So God says, I need you to know, I need you to understand. He says, I need you to be mindful of the fact that while you're going through this season of life, you do not have time to carry dead weight. He says, every contract that has expired needs to be discarded. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to help you so when you go home, you can say the preacher told me. That way it'd be, on, it'd be my fault and not, not your fault. Yeah, you need to discard every contract that's already been canceled. Quit trying to renew cancel contracts. It was for a season. There was a scope of work, a scope of interaction for that person or that situation in your life. And when the contract is over, you don't owe them nothing else. Because if you keep paying them when the contract is over, now you're taking money from something that you didn't have money for. Now you're depleting another account. You are dipping into another place and you're giving something to something that it shouldn't go to. And when we look at this COVID age that we're in right now, God says, I'm going to give you some contactless delivery and some contactless deliverance. Yeah. Let me show you this. It's, it's, it's some text. If you're going to experience this contactless deliverance, you have to accept the responsibility of recovery. That's point number one. You have to accept the responsibility of recovery. Verse number six says, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that cave, he said unto him, Will thou be made whole? Now the first thing that I ought to shout you about this verse, if you ain't already seen it, is that when Jesus walks onto the scene, remember I told you that he walks onto the scene and there are hundreds of people literally everywhere. And everybody that he can see, for as far as he can see in his natural eye, there's sick people everywhere. But the text says, when Jesus saw him lie. Which means that out of all the people that was there, Lord have mercy, yes, Jesus saw him. And since the lame man couldn't come to Jesus, Jesus came to him. Here's what, here's what I need you to know. Here's what I need you to know. That wherever you are, even if you think that nobody sees you, here's what I'm trying to tell you. That no matter who is around you, no matter who is on the other side, who's walked away, the Lord can see you right where you are. He knows where you are, how long you have been there, and the Lord can see you. The man's legs are lame, so he can't get up and walk to Jesus. So Jesus comes to him. We sing a song, come to Jesus. But can I tell somebody that when you're having difficulty getting to him, he'll come to you. I need somebody to remember that there were some times when you weren't even trying to get to the Lord. You were in some places that may have been a little subject and you weren't trying to hear the voice of the Lord that rained down in your spirit. You heard some calling your name. They said, I went to the meeting one night and my heart wasn't right. But something, yeah, it got a hold. It got a hold of me and it's holding me on the inside and I can't get free from it. Jesus said, since you can't come to me, he says, I'm coming to you. Since you can't come to the church, I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. The Lord said, I'm coming to you. Since we're not doing in person, he says, I'm coming to you in person. I'm not going to send Michael. I'm not going to send Gabriel. He says, I'm not going to send the come. He says, I'm coming myself. Jesus says, because I have a special delivery just for you. So now, Jesus comes to the man. He asks a critical question. He says, will thou be made Oh, now on the surface, it seems like it's a crazy question because the man is lame. If you know what that means, that don't mean he was a square. That don't mean that. 
It don't mean he had no swag. That ain't the name I'm talking about. It means he can't walk. All right. He cannot walk. So obviously, Brother Jesus, if he's lame, he wants to be able to walk. But Jesus asking this question made me question my own preconceived notion. Jesus says, do you really want to be made whole? Now, I remember my, my wife's uncle called DJ Blind Man. He's a blind DJ, y'all. Like, blind for real. Blind as back. But just awesome with his music. I mean, he's amazing, amazing man. And uh, legally, not just legally, but like, he's blind for real. And uh, he's so amazing. And I asked him one day, because he just talked to you. I said, oh, Charles, do you want to see? Do you want to be able to see? What if God will restore your sight? He said, I don't want God to restore my sight. He said, I don't want to be able to see. And that just messed me up. Because I'm thinking, as a person who can see, surely you want to be able to see. If you are a person who can see, talking to a person who's blind, you think they want to be able to see like you. But he said, listen, I learned everything I learned in the dark. And so therefore, light would be too much for me. I can't handle seeing because I'm used to not being able to see. Here's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Some folks that you think they want to be, they want to see, want to stay blind. Because when I become able to see, there is a burden to freedom. And sometimes we want to remain in the dark because we got plausible deniability that I didn't know. And so some folks don't want you to enlighten them with the word of God because as long as I don't know, I'm not responsible. I'm trying to help you save your strength. And so he said to me, I don't want to be able to see. And I realized that Jesus didn't ask this question because he was bored, but he asked this question because he wanted to know if the man really wanted to get better. Because there's some people who really don't want to get better because they benefit from being broken. I'm trying to help. I'm trying to help all of us. I'm trying to help you keep your strength where it needs to be. Jesus asked the question because depending on how this man answers him, this conversation is over. If you, you really don't want this, I'm not going to play the game with you. If you don't really want to be made, made whole, he says, I'm not going to waste my time trying to help you be whole if that ain't what you want. The pastor, I know, is telling me about a story his father told him. He said that a woman came to the altar in a wheelchair and he was doing a prayer line and believing by faith and whatever I pray God's going to do. And he, she rolled up in the wheelchair and immediately he knew what she wanted. So he said, woman, I'm going to pray right now by faith that the Lord raise you up from this wheelchair right in front of all of these witnesses. And she said, Rabbi, that ain't what I come here for. Don't do that. Don't pray that prayer. He's standing there bum fuzzled, as some would say. He don't understand. Why are you saying that? She said, because if the Lord raised me up out this chair, that's going to cancel my disability check. She was benefiting from her brokenness, so she didn't want to get better. Can I tell you that some of the folk that you think they are going to be whole, they are making their money from their malady. They don't want to be no better than what they are. Here you are up all night, praying and fasting, trying to impart wisdom, trying to make them better, but they benefit from that brokenness. Because as long as she's in the chair, she ain't got to walk. Somebody will push her. As long as she's in the chair, somebody will assist her. She ain't got to go get her own Somebody go get it for her. As long as she is in the chair, there's certain responsibilities that she does not have of her own. I don't want to get better. I'm benefiting from the brokenness. I want you to know that some folks see some benefit in being broken. So don't waste your time. Let me help you. Let, let me help. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 says that one of the enemy's main objectives is to wear out the saints. So if you try to make somebody whole who doesn't want to be whole, you're just going to wear yourself out. So Jesus is asking them, do you want to be made whole? It's not a crazy question, y'all. It's a clarifying question. Is your 
Uh, is your situation a matter of circumstance or is it a matter of choice? Did something happen that has you right here or are you choosing to be right here? Are you in the same position because you can't get up or are you in this situation because you don't want to get up? He says, I, need, I got a question. I need to know, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to head out or do you want to be made whole? He says, do you want to change or do you just want to be comforted? He said, do you want to be free or do you just want to feel better? And he said, I need you to ask these questions because there are some people in your life that you are bending over backwards for and they really don't even want to get better. You tired and they well rested because you're doing all the work. And if you try to make somebody better, I got to help you. If you try to make somebody better who is in love with bondage, you got to fight on your hands. You try to force somebody to be better and they like bondage. No, you, you got to fight on your hand. If you can be broken for so long that you become defiant when deliverance comes. And if you're trying to get somebody free from an infirmity that they like, you're going to be the one who comes out beat up and beat down. So here's the word from the Lord. Pray for everybody. But before you invest your time and energy into anybody, you better find out if they really want to be made whole. Because there is a responsibility in recovery. And God says, and sometimes you think God wants you to be hands-on. This is for somebody. You think God wants you to be so hands-on. And God says, I don't want you to be as hands-on as you think. He says, because what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do a contactless deliverance. Because some folks get tied up in the method or the point of contact and forget about the person who's actually doing it. And sometimes what we need to do is just pray, believe, and go to bed. Somebody write that. Pray, believe, and go on to bed. One more time for those who are in here. Pray, believe, and go on to bed. So Jesus assigns the responsibility of recovery to the man. He says, tell me what you want. But then the lame man replies with a very revealing response. Look at verse 7. It says, the impotent man answered him saying, Sir, I have no man when the water is trouble to put me in the pool. I ain't matching it. But while I am coming, <laughs> another steppeth down before me. So, so the lame man's response is very revealing because Jesus asked the man if he wants to be made whole, but the lame man responds by telling Jesus what he doesn't have and what people keep doing. I ain't asked you about nobody else. I ask you, do you want to be made whole? His very revealing response. And so God says, I need you to reconnect with what's really in your heart because everything that's in your heart that you think is in your heart is really connected to other people. You want stuff that other people have implied and imputed into your mindset. You think you want to be this and want to be that because that's what somebody told you you ought to be. But the reality is God said, what did I tell you? What did I implant into your heart, into your mind, and into your spirit? And you keep talking about what other people won't do and what you all have and what other people don't say. God says, I want to know what's in your heart. Here it is that he put there. But here's what the lame man is actually saying. He said, I ain't got nobody to put me in the water. And when I'm getting ready to go in, somebody step down before me. Here's what the lame man is actually saying. The lame man assumes, y'all, that Jesus knows how stuff goes down at the pool. He thinks that Jesus already knows the rules. So when he starts explaining to Jesus, he's not explaining how it works. So he's just explaining to Jesus why he hadn't been able to get in the pool as of yet. You know how this works. You come down here, the first one get in there when the water's trouble, blah, blah, blah. He said, but I can't walk. And so says, I can't walk. Uh-huh. When it's the time for this to happen, I can't get in. I ain't got nobody to put me in there. So the man reveals his faith and he reveals that it's tied to the rules of the pool and not the ruler of the universe. Okay, I'm going to make it plain to you. His faith is in the rules of the pool but not the ruler of the universe 
Now, now the rules at the pool says first come, first serve. But the ruler of the universe operates by appointment only. Okay. An appointment from God are not based on first come, first serve. Appointments from God are based on favor. And favor ain't fair. You can get that before me, but he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Which means that this blessing is delivered in his presence activated. And so ain't nobody going to eat until I get there. This table is for me. It's just set in front of you. And because of the grace on my life, and because of who I am, I may let you have some to eat. Uh-huh. But ain't nobody eating till I get there. I'm telling you, this, this came to life yesterday at the wedding. Because all these folks are sitting there waiting on the reception to start after the wedding. And they just sit there. It don't matter how hungry you are, how old or young you are. Ain't nobody eating till the bride and the groom come. Because this whole thing is for them. They done came in through the smoke machine and the sparklers and they done danced and they done said, oh, everybody's still hungry. But ain't nobody eating until the folk that this is all about come in the room. It's all I'm trying to tell you. You don't have to worry about trying to get there first because you got favor. And when you have favor, you ain't got to get there first because you got an appointment. I remember, I remember I went to the barbershop and every now and then you go to the barbershop, especially. I don't know how they have in the beauty shop, but I know at the barbershop, sometimes they get a little tense in there. Because uh, when you go in there and a barber can really cut, uh, he got a lot of folk waiting. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to tell some of y'all some who don't go to barbershops of uh, ethnic barbershops. Let me put it that way. If you come in the barbershop and he ain't got nobody in his chair and he walking around asking everybody who's going to cut you, who that means? Ah, uh, come on, somebody. <laughs> I know you got to start somewhere. But you just can't start right here. You know? so, somebody go <laughs> take a chance. This ain't gonna be me. I'm just trying to tell you. If he ain't got nobody in this chair, he ain't the one. Uh huh. That's the, the Holy Ghost ain't got to tell you. They just look at. He walking around because when you busy, you just look. I ain't got no more. You come back in two days. I'll try you next week. Uh huh. That means he ain't messed nobody up. You know what I'm saying? So I go to the barber shop, and when I walk in the barber shop, it's packed. But when I walk in the Bible shop, y'all, I had full confidence. Mm -hmm. Wasn't about nothing. I walk right in, ain't no seats in here. That ain't my problem. Because I don't need no seat over there. Because yeah. that's for all the folks who wait. Because yeah. yeah. what they didn't understand was I had an appointment. Yeah. So when I walked in, they sitting there waiting, thinking that they next, because they got there first. Yeah. But when I walked in the building, yeah. he moved the cover from a seat and said, have a seat. Let's get started. Because here's what I'm trying to tell you. You could have been an hour before me, two years before me, 30 years before me. But the reality is I got an appointment. This is my appointed time and my season. And because I got an appointment, you don't matter who got there first. You ain't got to fight to be first when you got favor. I hope somebody get what I'm trying to tell you. You don't have to promote yourself. You don't have to fight to be first when you got favor. Because when you got favor, the Bible says, that the last will be first and the first will be last. Your gift will make room for you and bring you the full great thing. You ain't got to be first because you got favor. Tell you, baby, you got favor. You got favor. Yeah. It's your season, it's your time, and your turn. All in the same moment. Yeah, y'all got to let me finish. Let me finish. Uh-huh. I don't need to be first. I got favor. <laughs> I ain't got to be first. I got favor. Now here's the burning question I got before I lose all of my voice. Because it's about going. I'm just telling you. Uh, here's the burning question I got. Uh, if this man don't have nobody to put him in the pool, question is, how did you get to the pool in the first place? You ain't got nobody to put you in there. How you get there? And it's only two things I can come up with. It's only two things. Number one, either he lives at the pool and never leaves. Or somebody brings him to the pool every day. But both of these seem a little problematic. So let's think that he's got So if he lives at the pool, then you would think that in 38 years, he could have figured out how to get in the pool. If, if, especially if he was 
one of us because we figure out that kind of stuff. We, we don't go get our cars fixed right off. We figure out that if you turn the steering wheel counterclockwise, you can start it. We figure that kind of stuff out. That if you don't turn the heat all the way up, but if you turn it to 76 and turn the things that way, it'll come off in the blow code. We figure, we're going to figure out how. Yeah, we were the ones who discovered that if you ain't getting good reception, put a little bit of on the antenna. Now, what did that? That ain't in nobody's book, but if you put fall on the antenna, yeah. We figured out that if your big Zenith TV that weighs 3,000 pounds go out, it makes a perfect TV stand to put the other TV on top of. That's ingenuity from the neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying. So I just believe if he looked like us in 38 years, you would have figured out something if you was going to roll, if you was going to scoop, something in 38 years of getting this walk. If you live there, you ought to be scoping everybody out now. You, ain't nobody going to, I don't care, you've been at your job a certain amount of time, ain't nobody going to come in and just get the promotion and you've been there. You know how to maneuver all around. No, you ain't just going to come in here uh, and do it like that. No, you ain't either. Because we don't play that kind of stuff. So in 38 years, how is it that this man don't figure out something to get in this water? And I was just thinking about myself, you know, because sometimes I just try to use my critical thing. I said, now, some of the people were blind, some of the people were lame. So if your legs don't work, but my eyes don't work, why don't we just get together and work together to get in this pool? Now, <laughs> your, your legs little, and my eyes <laughs> don't work. So why don't we come together? Figure out a way for both of us to get in the pool. I tell you what, now this is just me thing, I tell you what. Okay, Doc, since you can't walk and I can't see, why don't I pick you up? Cause you ain't got no legs, and you guide me to the pool, and whenever you see the water bubbling, say jump and we'll cannonball in to get in together. And the way both of us get what we need, I have eyes and you have legs, we go about our business. If we've been there, now I'm talking about 30, 38 years. Uh huh. We can get this thing done together, and I know that may sound crazy, but here what I'm trying to tell you: the Bible tells us when you talk about the Tower of Babel that we can do all kind of stuff if we just come together. Yeah. Some stuff we don't need the Holy Ghost to do if we just come together and work it out together. Yeah. Can I tell y'all? I see like this, mm. but Sister Connie can see like this, mm. and so she sees stuff that I miss, yeah. and so when working together, that's why I ain't miss all the meats. That I was gonna miss, cause I was gonna miss them, cause I forgot. <laughs> some of them in preaching the game, but I didn't write down. I wouldn't have been there yes, had it not been for somebody working with me to help me get this stuff done. Mm -hmm. So either he lives there, or somebody drops him off at the pool every day. Mm -hmm. So now, question is, if somebody gonna drop you off at the pool every day, then why won't they just take you all the way and just drop you off in the pool? In the pool. Because if I paid you for gas money, you taking me where I want to go. I'm just trying to take when, when I listen, this, this is my gas we own. Wherever I want, come on, somebody. We want all five of these dollars. I want you to take me here, there, and everywhere around. We don't think they ought to have no gas left off our gas money. We gonna, you can't benefit from this. All this gas money, I'm going to go everywhere. I don't know what it is about it. Lord, forgive us and help us and save us, deliver us all. But if he's going to bring you to the pool, why don't he just take you all the way and just drop you off in the pool? Here it is. The Lord said, you ain't got to think about that long. He said, because sometimes people can only take you so far. And if all of your trust is in the willingness and ability of other people to get you to your destiny, you're going to always fall short of God's best for your life. There's some people who still stuck right now because you wait on somebody to believe in you when God already done told you what to do. If heaven is behind you, it don't matter who don't believe you. I'm just, I hope you hear what I'm saying. So Jesus says, I got to show you that you have a responsibility of recovery. What do you really want? Then the lame man gives us a revealing response. He says, I ain't got nobody to put me in. I can tell him what he ain't got. But then the last part of it, that Jesus gives a very radical response. Look at verse 8. Jesus saith unto him, and we out of here. Take up thy bed and walk. Now don't miss this. Jesus asked the man if you want to be made whole. The lame man tells Jesus what he don't have and what people won't do. But Jesus doesn't even respond to what the man says. 
Jesus doesn't do what I thought he would have done because I thought if he would have he, he just said, okay, well, let me pray for you. Let me lay my hand on you. Let me put this prayer cloth on you like if you watch BDT late at night. Let me pour this water on you. I'm going to get you healed and helped. That ain't what Jesus does. Jesus simply stands where he is. Contactless deliverance. He says, rise up. Take up thy bed and walk. She said, no, I'm not going to touch you. I'm not going to put your hand, my hands on you. Because some of y'all think that the only deliverance God can bring is if the pastor, the preacher, or the prophet lay their hand on you. That's right. But he said, these signs shall follow them that believe, not them that preach or prophesy. Yeah. You can lay hands on yourself right where you are, and the same God of heaven will heal you and help you. He says, rise. Lord, why we tell a man who's been sitting down for 38 years to rise up? Jesus would have only told the man to get up if get up was already in it. Sometimes God just got to call forth what he knows that's already in you that you didn't think he could put a demand on you. I told y'all now, I keep telling y'all, I'm going to work out soon, but if a dog get out right now, you're going to find out that I can run, jump <laughs> as high as I need to not to have to deal with that. It'll put a demand on you. COVID-19 put a demand on the church. It put a demand on our communities. It put a demand on each of us to change. He says, I need you to rise. He says, because now the that is able to do it seemingly abundant above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. There's something already in us. God says, we just got to stir up the gift. But in order for him to obey his command, he has to get out of his mind that he needs another person to help him. He says, rise. Then he says, take up thy bed. Now notice Jesus doesn't tell him, get up and get out of here. Mm -hmm. Now that would have been easy, just get up and go. Jesus said, no, get up, take up your bed. Yep. Here's what I want you to know. Jesus telling him to take up his bed was not as much for the man as it was for everybody that was watching. Uh, he said, because I want all of you folk to see you carry what's been carrying you. I want everybody around you to see that you handling what's been handling you. So they can have the same faith because they were believing in the way of deliverance, but I'm trying to get them to believe in the one. We left the church thinking about a way, but the Lord said, I got to remind you of the one. Because even if you don't have a assigned seat or a place to park or certain stuff to wear, if you believe in the one who has saved us, He'll do it right where you are. He says, I want you to rise, take up your bed, and walk. Real simple, real deep. Move forward. That's all he says. Get up, because it's in you. Take up your bed, because I want everybody to see that was holding you, now you're holding it. He says, now I want you to walk. I need you to move forward. Verse 9 says, and immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Here's all I want to tell you. God says, I got contactless deliverance in mind for you. I was in prayer last week, I believe, and I sent a message to the praise team and I made to the to the I team, the intercession prayer team, to start praying for the lost, that they would come to Christ, to the backslid, that they would renew their fellowship with Christ. And that those whose minds have been blinded by the enemy, that the Lord will pull the scales off so that they can see the glorious gospel and the truth of his word so that they can come to Jesus. And here's the reality. God says, I reset all of creation with COVID-19. God didn't call it to be. He allowed it to be. But then he's using it for his glory. He's that kind of God. He says, you got out of the building. Because it's forced the church to be outwardly focused. Because you ain't got nobody in the building but 10 if you're doing it right. Now he's old lifted, but you know what I mean. That you can preach to in the building. It's forcing us to look outside of the four walls. He says, if I couldn't get you to go out there on your own, I'm going to force you to look outside the four walls because not you ain't had nobody to talk to. He's forced us to open up the doors of our church wide for all who are heavy laden so they can come and get the rest that comes with Christ. 
And so what I want to do today is offer to you, if you are lost in your sin, if you have not accepted Jesus, you either found or you're lost. Ain't no in-between. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, hell will be your home when you close your eyes on this side. And I'm not trying to preach fear at all. Hell is a reality. But here's the bigger and greater reality. That the love of Christ is so transformative that if you come and let the Lord live in your heart, he's so strong and his love is so amazing that God will teach you how to love yourself.